So we started recording now. Okay. And uh, here. So uh, a few more words about me. Uh, I'm Bente Liljabi. I come from Norway. I'm a long time member of the GEO community. And I'm a member of the GEO um, equality, diversity and inclusion subgroup, among others. Uh, our first uh, speaker uh, will be uh, James Rattling Leaf uh, Sr. Uh, he is um, a founding member of the GEO Indigenous Alliance. And as a principal of the Volakota Lab, he serves as a guide to organizations to work more eff effectively with Indigenous people for a more equitable world. He specializes, specializes in developing programs that utilize the interface between Indigenous peoples, traditional knowledge and Western science. He has over 25 years experience serving as a cross-cultural or broker resource to federal government, uh, higher education institutions and nonprofits to, develop, uh, to, to developing and maintaining positive ongoing working relationships with federally and non-federally recognized Indian tribes, tribal college and universities, and tribal communities. He was born on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, and he is an enrolled member of the Rosebud CU tribe or nation. So we are moving. The next panelist will be um, Anna uh, Amaguanya from Ecuador. And she is an indigenous woman from the Quichua Otavalo people of Ecuador. And she, uh, for a period from 22 to 24, she accompanied the work of Land is Life in the coordination of the Secretary of the International Working Group of Indigenous Peoples in Isolation and Initial Contact. For short, G-T-I-P-I-A-C-I. -I -I. Currently, she is assuming function as a program coordinator from uh, 4PIHEI in Lanis Life. She aspires to contribute to the formulation of effective actions in favor of uh, the defense, protection, and promotion of the rights of indigenous people with emphasis on indigenous people in isolations and contact. So uh, our next panelist is then Rich Shodhari, and he is a member of the Taru nations from the foothills of the Himalayas in Nepal, where the rhinos and the elephants used to roam freely. Raised in a multi-generational Taru family, he uh, carries his ancestors' oral teachings of relationships, leaderships, compassion, storytelling, diplomacy, reciprocity, customary law, governance, indigenous economics, and resource management. He is an Indigenous people's rights activist with over 15 years of experience leading social change programs and organization. He is the founding president of a global home for Indigenous peoples, a French association, and he represents the Indigenous peoples of Asia region as a steering committee member of the Coalition on the Global Alliance of Future of Food and Tenure Facility. He has a bachelor in economics, African studies, and master's degree in public administration. Last but not least, uh, we have um, Tanya, uh, Tanya Eulalia Martinez Cruz. She is an AU uh, indigenous in disciplinary researchers from Oaxaca in Mexico. And she is an associate researcher at, a researcher at the Free University of Brussels, working on indigenous people's water, food, and knowledge systems. She uses her research to advocate for respect of indigenous people's knowledge systems and their meaningful participation in food and water related policy processes using rights based approach. She is also an independent consultant uh, on indigenous people's issues the Food, Water, Energy Nexus, and Social Inclusion. Currently, she is a focal point for Latin America for the Coalition on Indigenous Peoples' Food Systems. She believes in the role of education to change lives positively and does advocacy work on the rights and access to education for Indigenous girls and women in STEM. So 
there you have our wonderful uh, panel of experts. And I will start now by stopping sharing my screen. And I will turn to uh, you, James, first and ask you uh, the first question. And that is, can you tell us about the GEO Indigenous Alliance, its mission and its vision? We can start with that. James. Well, thank you, uh, Bente. And let me begin by introducing uh, myself to you all in my Lakota language. We say, how midakia api chante wa shte napa chikzapalo. James Rattling Fimachi api nasi changa Lakota oyate. Uh, it's good to be with you today, and thank you um, for uh, an invitation to be with you. The Geo-Indigenous Alliance uh, was founded in 2018 at the Canberra, at Canberra, Australia, Geo Ministerial Summit. It was founded by a, a core group of leaders who still work today to really advance and empower Indigenous people to use Earth observations um, for their um, for their self determination and sovereignty. And we've been working. Um, through a number of years now since that time to develop projects within the community so that we can bring uh, different ways of knowing together. And in this case, it's Earth Observation, Science Day, and Technology with Traditional Knowledge. And we do that through not only our, our core group of, of leadership, but also in partnerships. So we're glad that through these last few years, we've had partners who come with us, come alongside us to really advance our understanding of how you bring these two ways of knowing together, which I believe is a critical question for today, is how do we work with different ways of knowing, both from the Western science side as well as indigenous people's side. And so we've been doing that um, through a grassroots effort. And what I mean by that is we don't have dedicated funding to do this work, but we have a collective vision uh, to do why we do this and, and why we do it, but also more importantly, to what effect, to what impact we can do. The world is big, lots of indigenous people, as was mentioned earlier, and the importance of indigenous people today. So it's important that we um, we have these conversations, that we bring together um, other indigenous voices as we have here today to begin to better understand how we do this work, but also why we do this work. The challenges that we face today are, are immeasurable, like climate change, loss of biodiversity, and even uh, environmental or social justice these are very critical issues that face our indigenous people, but more importantly, it's how we do this work. I think that really matters. So we have a number of things um, that we've been doing these last few years really to advance and advocate for indigenous people and through many different platforms. Uh, we've been involved in COP, the COP 16s. We've been involved in the GEO ministerial summits. We've been part of the UN water conferences. So we've been a voice not the voice, but a voice for indigenous people in those settings so that when issues come up or when uh, opportunities come up, we can uh, we can share those, we can bring our perspective and we wanna, we wanna grow and we wanna expand. So that's why we're here today to be with uh, my fellow panelists to hear their work, get to know them, get to know their work, but more importantly, what can we do to address the important issues that we face as indigenous people? So I'll stop there, Bente, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, James, for that introduction, uh, setting the scene. Now, to follow up on that, since we are now in, in uh, GEO, in the Group on Earth Observations, how is the Alliance ensuring that GEO advocates for Indigenous people's rights and the Indigenous data sovereignty? Well, to me, in my opinion, uh, GEO needs to begin to work uh, diligently and um, forthrightly and intentionally with um, efforts like the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People. So for those who don't know, we call it UNDRIP. But if, what UNDRIP is, it provides a, a strong framework for supporting Indigenous data sovereignty as it emphasizes the rights of Indigenous people to self-determination, control over their lands and protection of their cultural heritage. And these can be done in several ways. So I want to, I'm glad this is recorded because I do think that uh, there's a lot of information here I want to share in a short amount of time. I think number one, uh, it's right to self-determination, which is in article three. 
Uh, number two, it's FPIC, or Free and Prior Informed Consent. That's Article 19 and 32. Uh, no, Article 31 is number is protection of cultural heritage. Number four, Article 18 says participate, the right to participate in decision making. Article 28 says restitution and redress in cases where indigenous data has been used or misused without a consent. UNDRIP supports the right to restitution and redress. This can empower indigenous community to seek the return of data. Um, or compensation for its unauthorized use. Number six, I would say, is strengthening sovereignty and jurisdiction. In my part of the world, in the United States, and in, in my nation, we've been working many years, really, trying to understand how UNDRIP fits into our legal framework, both as a Western construct, but also indigenous law. And so we're looking to begin to continue to ex exercise jurisdiction over our data and how it extends to the broader system. And finally, I would say, Vente, is what role do we have in international collaboration and support? So that's Article 39. So UNDRIP encourages states and international organizations to provide support for indigenous peoples to implement the rights recognized in the declaration. This can include technical and financial assistance for developing indigenous data governance structures. So in summary, UNDRIP provides a legal and moral foundation for indigenous state of sovereignty by affirming indigenous people's rights for control to control their data in alignment with their self-determination, cultural heritage, and governance systems. Back to you, Vente. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, James. Uh, and it's well noted in addition to, <laughs> to the recording. Uh, moving on, in, in the interest of time, and, and I have a question follow-up for you, James, uh, just so you know. Uh, but, but for now, we are moving to, to Anna. Um, Anna, and now what would you say, what are the main challenges that Indigenous communities in isolation are facing? Thank you so much. Alipunja, Alichishi, Alituta, Yupachani, Kai, Sumatanda, Kunamanda. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much to GEO Indigenous Alliance for the invitation to participate in this webinar on August 9th. As we celebrate the International Day of Indigenous Peoples, I extend a cordial greeting to my Indigenous brothers and sisters around the world and all the audience, and thank you all for connecting. So among the main challenges facing our Piasi, uh, brothers and sisters are their territorial and political vulnerability. Their territories are being threatened due to the development of legal and illegal activities within the forest. Illegal logging, illegal mining, and drug trafficking imply a, di a direct threat to the natural environment, the forest, and therefore to the survival of these peoples. Infrastructure works road constructions, and the presence of Mennonited groups are other factors that are treating these peoples. The consequence could not be more serious. This practice can disrupt traditional practice, force contact, disseminate flora and fauna, and even lead to the death of Yasi. The lack of legal protection and respect for their territories and their lives are the other challenges that the Piasi are subject to. There is a great lack and absence from the states regarding the recognition of the existence of the people's involuntary isolation and initial contact. There are no laws or protective actions. There are no specific norms, public policies for the protection of the territory and PSC lives. In addition, there, in addition, there is a lack of territorial governance or interest from the states. It should be noted that the right to the self-determination and free prior and informed consent continue to, to be violated since their territories are taken without the permission of the indigenous peoples. For example, in Peru, the government wants to make changes to the Piasi law, a law that protects the territorial rights of the Piasi. The same thing is happening in the Philippines. The government also wants to review the guidelines of this principle that protects and safeguards the lives of indigenous peoples. So they want to make change that will be weaken the policies and guidelines to, for these peoples. The other difficult that we found as a organization is obtaining financing. Piazzi protection really measures 
Financing Act and respond to the different situation which the people's involuntary isolation and, and initial contact faces. This includes surveillance systems, monitoring systems, members training in law, regulation, and standards of PIAC issues. Many funders are unaware of about that, or just they don't understand the importance of these people. So I stop here and I give you to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. That, those are some serious uh, challenges for sure. Um, now, coming to, to perhaps some, some ideas on solutions. So how can the international community, such as GEO, support this indigenous community more effectively? Can, can Earth observations play a role in that? Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to say that the coordination is really important with the international community and with the states, because the magnitude of the problem demands great, greater political will, as well as a human and material resources. Governments and international organizations must exert pressure on countries within, within which PIAC live and have a live it since before those countries existed, to adopt and apply laws that protect and safeguard the rights of the PIAC. Uh, and also, I think that Earth observation play a leading role in monitoring, protecting, and managing sustainable natural resources in indigenous territories. And why not in the capacity building and community empowerment too? Using uh, the earth observation technology can help us to detect illegal activities such as logging and mining and protect their territories from outside invasions. So this is really vital for PSC, for these peoples, since lands are often treated by extractive activists, act activities. In addition, the satellite monitoring can support the development of effective and sustainable conservation plans. Earth observation offers training programs for indigenous communities so we can acquire those skills to use the earth observation technology. So this helps us to empower the indigenous communities as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Uh, so a bit, uh, a bit that we can do, even though the challenge is uh, very impressive, and uh, we know that. Anyways, uh, we should not give up. Uh, and a person who doesn't give up either <laughs> is uh, uh, Bridge. Um, I um, have a question for you. Are you ready for us? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, Bridge. Hi. So, seen from your perspective, what are the most pressing challenges faced by indigenous people in voluntary isolation in asserting their rights to autonomy and self-determination? Uh, first of all, uh, namaste to everybody and thank you very much, Geo Alliance, for you know, Indigenous Alliance for inviting me to this thing. And I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Um, yeah, the, uh, it's a great question, you know. Um, the people in isolation and initial contact, the challenges that they face is uh, the mining, <laughs> the destruction that's happening in their territories. And uh, there's a statistics, you know, 50% uh, of the 500, 5,097 mining projects globally are happening today. Mm -hmm. uh, so out of those uh, <laughs> 5,000 mining projects, 54% are in indigenous people's territories. Uh, or near their uh, land and forest. So imagine the destruction that's happening in their territories and forests and territories for indigenous people or indigenous people in isolation, that's their home. So for us, we have a construction building that is our house, but our territory is our house. So when that gets destroyed, our food system gets affected, our governance system gets affected, uh, people are pushed away. Our language is in danger. Um, so, so these are the challenges, you know, and when we fight back, so there's a statistics in 2022, 41% of the attacks uh, uh, on uh, uh, land defenders uh, were indigenous people. So this is in 2022. Of all the attacks that happened uh, in 2021, 41% 40, 
uh, were uh, attacks were on indigenous people's land defenders. So you can imagine this, uh, the the severity of the problem uh, when when they are in their territory, and also the, for people in isolation and initial contact, the the contact with the external world might really uh, harm them when it comes to diseases. So they have a different immune system that they have developed, and if a contact that uh, not, uh, non-indigenous people from uh, another territories goes there, they might have a severe ch uh, challenges. So they inherently, they have a very strong knowledge system, governance system, uh, a worldview, which, you know, uh, which enlightens the uh, our whole humanity and they should be protected. But the state, the multinational corporations, you know, the spirit that we call it uh, the leader, it's a spirit of greed that is pushing them uh, to the margins. So these are the challenges, you know, that I, I can uh, think of on my mind. Yeah, and back to you, Bente. Uh, a critical mi uh, mining for mining is a big, big issue for uh, this, for, for indigenous people, mining and development projects. Uh, Hydropower conservation, <laughs> conservation areas, land dispossession, uh, infrastructure project, agricultural tourism, you know, and conservation areas, natural national parks. This all <laughs> uh, jeopardizes the well-being of uh, uh, indigenous people in voluntary isolation and initial contact. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And 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 this is uh, just an observation. So we do have um, indigenous people in Norway as well, and mm -hmm. and even. And, and we have, I mean, it, the, the problem with what you are describing in mining and uh, infrastructure, et cetera, is a challenge for all, uh, even in this country, but even more so, I would say, yeah. for so, so it's extra, <laughs> extra yes. challenging for, for these communities in uh, voluntary isolation and uh, initial contact. Um, so it should be recognizable. That's uh, to the entire community. I mean, and not only the indigenous people. Now, mm -hmm. f follow up a question. Uh, so, so again, for for you as well, then uh, Bridge, how can international frameworks such as the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, so like James was mentioning, mm -hmm. uh, but also Geo, be more effectively implemented to protect their rights? So, uh, uh, United Nations, you know, and even the uh, states uh, like Brazil, Canada, United States, there are very new things to indigenous people. So, United Nations started engaging with, with indigenous people since 1980s. In uh, 1924, the League of Nations were denied. And still, there is a huge challenge when we think about integration of indigenous people in these processes, in the decisions that we uh, that governs our life, that affects our life, we are very far from that, you know. Although there is successes, there's a declaration, uh, declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, ILO Convention 169, there are treaty bodies. <laughs> However, they are very, uh, uh, we're not very close to those uh, mechanisms, you know. However, they, they can be effective. There are a lot of success stories that we have used this international mechanism to uh, get our territory, uh, have our own autonomy, uh, 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 self-determination, governance, managing our own territory, FPIC, all these things that James mentioned, you know, uh, it, it's that. However, there's a huge challenge. For instance, at the Human Rights Council, we don't have a seat where we cannot uh, uh, dialogue with state uh, as an uh, independent, uh, what do you call, sovereign nations. So it would be good if uh, a Human Rights Council could have a permanent seat of indigenous people where we can dialogue with states on the issues that really affect us. But it's, it's a huge process. Um, but at the same time, when you, when you look at all these processes at the United Nations, there is like accreditation process. We're not NGOs. Indigenous peoples are not NGOs, you know? So these things has to change. <laughs> and at the ECOSOC, which is at the United Nations in New York, uh, we need the Under Secretary General for Indigenous Peoples so that we have a permanent uh, uh, office of secret uh, secretary that governs, that uh, formulates, co coordinates all these activities and you know, uh, informs member state. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have a voluntary national report uh, there is hardly any mention of indigenous people. I think states can really do well in terms of updating uh, what's happening with their indigenous population that they live in. And all the countries where, you know, <laughs> how to say, uh, uh, indigenous people in voluntary isolation and, and initial contact live, 
Most of them have uh, ratified ILO Convention 169, except for countries in Asia, Indonesia, India, and Papua New Guinea, they haven't ratified, but they have ratified on RIP. So there is a moral obligation for the states to, you know, uh, uh, be good <laughs> to its citizens who, who they live, you know, and, and uphold uh, best practices of human rights. Um, and I think, and for GEO, you know, uh, partnership is very important, you know, um, how to say. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge system that indigenous people hold that could, could be very beneficial for uh, uh, geo alliance as well and tanya and i were at uh, rome there was a conference <laughs> about how we can bridge this two uh, world together there is an opportunity and it's now <laughs> you know so we need more dialogue we need more uh, uh, we, we need to enlarge the table and i'm gl glad that diversity inclusion at your office is bringing indigenous people into your conversation so yeah that, that's that's uh, that's what, what i have and uh, uh, we have like this thing called uh, universal periodic review and the human rights council each year each four year uh, a country uh, reviews uh, the human rights conditions of its people so we need to be there indigenous people need need to be there geo alliance could uh, you know all these international organizations could enhance the participation of indigenous people because it's not easy for indigenous people to be there so you know these are the things um and be a strong ally you know i think uh, the world can be a strong ally because what we hold does not just benefit indigenous people, it benefits the whole world. So we protect our uh, 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 snow leopard, you know, our forest. It does not benefit our food system. It benefits the whole food system, the other ecosystems that, you know, we <laughs> that gets affected. So I'll stop there. But, you know, uh, engage with us, you know, be a strong ally. That's what I would say. And yeah, the states must uh, uphold the human rights principles that they have signed, you know. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there, Bente. Yeah, thank you very much for those uh, important thoughts and ideas. Now, uh, I don't think I mentioned that, but GEO is a governmental organization. We have uh, more than, well, close to 115 member countries, governments, and we have uh, an equal uh, number of participating organizations, many of whom are you know, part of the UN system. So it's a huge um, community. Uh, it's based on volunteer contributions, which is both an opportunity and a challenge for us also in terms of resources. And I, I know James has been talking about this uh, a lot. He And you brought it up. And I think others are also the resources necessary. Uh, there are some more um, perspectives that you you triggered my mind, uh, Bridge. I will come back to that because now I think it's time for us to hear what Tanya has to say uh, on my questions. <laughs> so Tanya, uh, in what ways do the lifestyles of these indigenous people help in preserving their ecological environment? I think this was a natural segue from... Uh, a seg from from uh, bridge there so the lifestyles uh, tanya what can we what can we do could we please play the video of alicia because i think she's going to answer that question please thank you oh, oh oh yeah you want me to play that video okay uh i had it open here let me see here it is yes let me share my screen Let's see if this works. Share it, and then I will open it like this, and I will start it there. Bente, we can't hear it. Okay, you you have to read it. it. It has subtitles in, in, in English just because the, the message is in Spanish. So if you can read it, that that's well. In
Okay. Oh, sorry Fine. about sorry about the sound, but what Alicia basically she is saying, and I I hope Anna can elaborate more than Alicia because she's a, 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 a huge character in in the defense of indigenous peoples in voluntary isolation and initial contact rights. Uh, we say you, when when you started the session, Bente, you said indigenous people safeguard eighty percent of the world's remaining biodiversity. And Alicia says in her video, because we have learned to live in that environment, we have shaped and the environment has shaped us back. And in, when we look and compare this with scientific data, what they tell you is like a quarter of the air surface overlaps with a third, indigenous lands uh, covering a quarter of the air surface and overlapping with a third of the intact forest. They show you that these forests that are in indigenous territories have reduced deforestation, degradation, carbon emissions as compared even to the protected areas that have become a boom and something super famous. So why is that we need to protect people just yes, because they are individuals? Yes, because we need to guarantee their rights, but also because what is st at stake, it's our own well-being as a society and as a world. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, yes, uh, it's too bad we couldn't hear, even though you don't hear uh, Spanish, but uh, thank you, Tanya, for sharing the the video, the link to the video also in, in the chat so you can enjoy it later. Uh, now, I have another question for you, Tanya. Uh, how are external developments affecting their lands and territory? You have a partly answered it already, but how can you elaborate on that and how can earth observations be used to protect them? Yes, uh, so like Anita mentioned in her presentation, there are several threats that are affecting indigenous peoples. They forests, they homes are being destroyed by agricultural expansion, fires, illegal mining and other extractive industries. Even the ones that we are calling a just transition or the green energies are also having a negative impact in these territories. We cannot also put aside the religions missionaries. You might remember that episode of India where some missionaries were shot because yes, people don't want them. They have chose to live in isolation, but there's like a lot of pressure from many, many other external actors. There's a lack of recognition on the rights as Bridge mentioned uh, to the lands and also we are missing national laws that can support them. So three concrete ways in which I think geo observations, mapping, spatial tools could support indigenous peoples in voluntary isolation and initial contact are first. Uh, so we have many allies. Anita said we have to create alliances. So we have to be continue supporting um, indigenous peoples in voluntary isolation. I hope Anna can share more about the group that she was working for, but Land is Life one, is one of these partners. And we must support indigenous peoples and organizations that are at the boundaries, helping to defend the forest, to protect the lives of these peoples, to monitor real, in real time the threats and illegal activities that are happening in these territories. And, the different atrocities that are committed against them. So actions can be taken to protect their rights. Secondly, we can help and support indigenous peoples through mapping, uh, supporting them to have a better management and planning of their, for, for the management of their resources. And that can also be done with these different tools. Third, like Anita also said, capacity building. We have said, it's international people says, we don't want any other conversation or decision made about us without us. So who we have to train, what capacities we have to develop is the capacities of these indigenous peoples. So they can use these tools, get empowered themselves and fight the fights that they've been fighting for already many centuries. Um, I think lastly, like is, James mentioned all this action should be done in accordance to the right to free prior and informed consent, as well as respecting the data sovereignty and privacy, privacy to protect uh, all this data. Because data says, people says like data, it's power, but also power can be, or this information can be continue used to promote extractivism. So this is why we have to pay attention also to data sovereignty. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. There are so many things here that has uh, come up. Um, 
And now uh, the, we have come to the part, we are a little bit late, but we still have time to have an open floor discussion. Um, and uh, you, we can do it like this, uh, that the audience here is invited also to raise their hand and ask questions to the panel. And uh, you can also ask your question in, in the chat, if you like. So while you are contemplating on that, I I have, uh, you know, what I was thinking of, literally, when you say voluntary isolation um, and without initial contact. And then I was thinking, based on what James, that, uh, you know, we have been talking with James before, so, uh, you know, he is bridging between traditional knowledge and Western science, if you like, but what if they want to stay, if they want to stay and maintain the lifestyle that they have, and we, um, representing the Western kind in this, to say it simply, uh, Western kind style of knowledge and uh, information, how can that be compatible if they want to maintain their current lifestyle? You know, isn't that a clash? Uh, do you have any thoughts on the cap what kind of capacity development would be would be relevant for these communities tanya you first since you were last yes i think i'm going to pass this question to anna because i think alicia is actually a really good example and that's why that video became so important to me because we need bridges it's self-determination but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are totally isolated from everything but anita can tell you more about that because she has been more on that okay anita over to you Thank you so much, Bente. First of all, uh, I would like to say uh, something important to understand. Uh, these people's involuntary isolation and the initial contact are two different uh, uh, groups. First of all, the indigenous peoples who want to live isolated, these indigenous, these indigenous, sorry, we do not have contact with the with the uh, majority population. They also they also tend to avoid any type of relation or contact with other indigenous peoples. Why? Because they are living like freely in their territories. In addition of this, uh, regarding of the uh, predetermination, the principle of these indigenous peoples is to safeguard the no contact because you, we know that those peoples is living uh, in their own territory. In addition, the indigenous peoples in initial contact, those peoples who previously remained in isolation and due to different factors that I men mentioned before, uh, they're, they're on, by their own decisions, enter in contact with the majority population. So we have these two, uh, the PIA by its acronym in Spanish, uh, people, uh, Pueblos Indígenas en Aislamiento, and the other ones, PC, Pueblos Indígenas en, in, in Contacto Inicial. So we need to understand these two things. And also their ways of life and ancestral knowledge that they preserve important ecosystems and are invaluable human heritage that they contribute to the, the fight against the climate emergency and biodiversity loss. This is really important. So I don't know, I can answer the question. <laughs> No, it, it, it's it's yeah. you point to that there's different categories, and I was thinking of the most extreme. I I mean we heard there there are obvious reasons that there are challenging to do to make that contact both danger for the uh, the uh, biodiversity uh, you know nature ecology and the humans themselves uh, because of not being exposed to the germs that we are exposed to, so that in itself is is a challenge. But then. I was thinking we, I, I, what I've been thinking is that we have so much to learn uh, from these communities that would be helpful for us to maintain the rest of the world, you know, <laughs> but as, and, and, and James has been, I think you've been indoctrinated me a little bit, uh, you know, we, we, 
you should not just take i mean you should think respect or uh, you know the sovereignty and you know ex make sure that you do not exploit so those are you know very fine fine lines here now i will stop talking and i will give the floor to jorge uh, cabrera you have asked for the floor you have your hand raised can you yes yes Hi. 20 uh, thank you very much for the presentation. My question is, uh, uh, we understand that the problems of in, indigenous people in all the world have a very similitude, but in terms of the uses of earth information uh, for the different platforms of satellite information, what are the more, more uses platform that you have access because we understand that many of these indigenous people also doesn't have uh, access to the communication, to the technology. What is the way that you consider that could be good to go to the local level that uh, the indigenous uh, groups could use the satellite information at the local level? And what are the platforms that are more useful for for this organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Uh, maybe I can give the floor to uh, to James on this. Have you reflected on this? Sure. Yeah. Well, I have uh, I have nine things to share on that. <laughs> Hang on now, nine things. Well, in, in the context of I think Geo and my experience working with Geo, uh, that's a Geo writ large is that you know Geo as was mentioned, is composed of many nation states. And I think what what GEO can do is promote our participation uh, in Earth observation activities. So there's a lot of things happening around sat forms and things like that. We need to know that. I think when we talk and we get engaged with indigenous people, we got to respect FPIC. I think we got to enhance data sovereignty, right? So what are the protocols that GEO uses or promotes or practices or teaches and shares with his researches and such, that's important. So somebody mentioned capacity building and technical systems. I think that's great. I think we need to support uh, indigenous-led research and initiatives. How do we do that? Also, you know, we don't want to be doing everything. We need to figure out how we work and support existing indigenous organizations and networks, like the Geo Indigenous Alliance. And we obviously we all have to get on board in terms of protecting indigenous lands and resources. We talk about ways of knowing. And I think it's really important that I think I want to say this. What we have today in terms of indigenous knowledge is very important. Will that be sustained for the next generation and beyond? Those are questions that we have within ourselves and my tribe, my nation. We talk about that a lot. And something I think that can be facilitated in terms of knowledge is our languages. So let's not forget indigenous languages as one of the key vehicles and key platforms to continue to build our own knowledge systems and strengthen ourselves, but also then we have a decision if we want to share that abroad. And finally, I think, you know, things like this are really important. Uh, awareness and advocacy, right? We all have an opportunity to, to share and to take responsibility for what we're learning today. And so for so much, you know, we have all, have all this knowledge and all this data now. My question is, where is the wisdom in that? And I think that indigenous people still hold wisdom and that's because of our place an understanding of our connection to the land. And so we have to continue to strengthen that. So it's, it's our culture, it's our language, it's our land and our spirituality, which we haven't talked about yet. But I would say those are foundational and pillars for us to go forward uh, as indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, and I was going to have, I have a follow-up question. I promised you a question, James, in the beginning. Uh, and you know that GEO, so GEO has, is founded on open data sharing. I mean, and, and I'm not quite sure if all the governments are aware of what they have signed up for, but we actually agreed on open data sharing principles, meaning that unless you have a very good reason not to, you should openly share your data. Uh, and then we also expanded on that uh, lately to open knowledge sharing. And, and that's moving towards you, you using the word wisdom. I mean, uh, James, so I think that, you know, moving from data and information to knowledge and wisdom, we, it's, 
is when we can actually make use of it, right? Practical use of it. And now, how is that? And and I, you know, we have this data sharing, uh, data management principles that will facilitate this uh, data sharing. And we have also started to develop more practical implementation guidelines for the open knowledge sharing. And James, you have been, uh, you know, uh, talking in one of our dialogue series about the care principles, because we have care, you have geo, which is the most open, and we have fair and care and trust principles. And care principles, uh, would my question to you, would you say, because I know you've been involved in it, would you say that that is a, uh, a vehicle to follow up on those UN um, rules, uh, agreements? Is care actually capturing the protection of sovereignty uh, and so on? Mm. Well, thank you, Bitte, for that question. It's a great question. And I think um, here in the United States, you know, I've been working in, in dialogue with uh, universities and academia. And so there's a lot number of efforts now happening to begin to understand how we implement the care principle, which care is collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. Oh. And in, in, in implementing that, you need indicators. And I, I have this list here. I'll share a few of them for you as an example. So what do we talk, what's an indicator for collective benefit? Well, I think one of them is uh, data needs assessment. Another one is utilizing indigenous identifiers. Number three, maybe is supporting indigenous use. Uh, number four could be alignment of permissions for data access and reuse in indigenous frameworks. That's that's an example of indicators for the, for the C part or collective benefit. How about authority to use or control? It's recognition of indigenous data sovereignty, recognition of FPIC, transparent ethics approval processes, transparent community permissions processes, and, and, and enable audit of indigenous data. How about the responsibility that are part of care? Build relationships with indigenous people, number one, support capacity building, promote equitable distribution, including acknowledgement and authorship, collect data relevant to indigenous languages and worldviews, Ensure data of interest are fund are findable by communities. And finally, we could say enable indigenous metadata fields. The last, the E of care is ethics. Support the use of indigenous ethical frameworks. Promote indigenous interpretation and presentation of findings. Share data of interest with indigenous organizations. Reflect indigenous knowledge systems in agreements compensate research participation, share copyright. Agreements reflect indigenous methods for dispute resolution. And finally, administrative mechanisms for rights violations and research. So what I shared with you again are these growing, evolving indicators of how we practice the care principle, which is very key in terms of advancing this, this, you know, this point we're at in terms of open access, uh, indigenous access, and so forth. And so Academia has a role to play, obviously, in terms of that, but also the community and are just as important. So we have to reflect on these ideas. We have to provide input on these ideas. And when we need to change or be advocates to change these indicators, then we have the ability and the wherewithal to do it. So everybody, in my view, has a responsibility here to be informed, but also to be advocates and, and not to just take each other's word for it, but for us to even go deeper and deeper into this work because it's important. So, and, and then finally encourage uh, the generations, right? We haven't heard, I haven't heard youth yet talked about today, but an importance of young indigenous scholars to take on these complex challenges because because open access, open science, indigenous science, indigenous, those are complex issues mm -hmm. because they're different and the diversity among the indigenous people is, is there. So we want to respect that and honor our diversity. Just because there's a whole bunch of it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's a good thing that we still have indigenous sovereignty, indigenous diversity, because we've survived colonization. We survived those things that happened to us. And yet today in 2024, here we are. We're talking together through this platform in, in, in terms of being, uh, being good relatives, wanting to be good relatives, not only to each other, but also to the land. So um, that'd be my response, Pente. Yeah, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. And I, I can just say uh, we, we need to wrap it up now. Uh, I think we, we don't have uh, heard more from you, Bridge. Uh, do you have a, an additional something that you would really like to share with us, by the way? I want to give you the floor, the opportunity. I know what Bente, I, I don't have much, but I think uh, James really made it uh, clear, you know. And of course, I just want to uh, think about like, young people, you know, and our children, how we are uh, creating uh, environments for them so that what our ancestors have done, they could live uh, similar environments, you know, similar laws, similar governance system. They can speak the language, you know. That's something that I would like to uh, address. And yeah, we have to we have to create that environment, you know, so yeah. that the indigenous worldviews and our our spirituality and our connection to the land continues. Although there is a huge migration of young people, you know, out of territories for many reasons. Yeah. Yes. Yes, indeed. And um, by the way, uh, since you we are you you both mentioned the youth, we do have. Uh, the International Youth Day on Monday. So I can only encourage you here as representatives of the indigenous people to encourage your youth to attend uh, those webinars. We will show some uh, examples, uh, both personal stories for why they are using Earth Observations and some examples of what they are using Earth Observation for. So I think that will be very inspirational. It's from people from across the world and from many different disciplines. So I think uh, this is an open invitation. <laughs> Since you were mentioning the youth, we are also celebrating the youth. And we have, of course, the GEO Youth uh, Declaration. Um, let me see if I have any more questions. I don't think so. Uh, it's on the hour, so I would like to start to wrap up. Uh, it's very, it's it's uh, difficult uh, to wrap up such uh, <laughs> a rich, um, information that we got in this very short time. Um, but uh, I would like to uh, to summarize that um, GEO should follow more closely and collaborate with the UN uh, in terms of uh, frameworks uh, named, mentioned by James and others. And I think that's something we should uh, take with us. And this will be in line with the other a follow up, we are following the uh, sustainable development goals of the UN, etc. So I think this is something that can be followed up. And the starting point is exactly uh, in the GEO Indigenous Alliance and actually also the GEO uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Working Group uh, that GEO has, uh, is organizing and I'm one of the representatives of. Now, the specific challenges uh, is, of course, and I think I will do make it short, but the territory, you know, the territories of the indigenous people are in danger from many different reasons, uh, mining, uh, logging, uh, etc. And, uh, and what I think we need to emphasize is that this is not just just nature, which all of us rely upon, but it's actually the homes of those indigenous people in these areas. I think that destruction of homes is not only destruction of territories, but actual homes of people. I think that was a, a nice uh, observation um, that uh, or detail that might be overlooked. Uh, training and uh, capacity development is also relevant for these um, voluntary uh, communities and initial contact communities. Uh, and we should um, uh, use the methods that you, the indigenous people have identified as, how would you say, viable? I'm sorry if, the, if that's the correct English word, but to, to adapt to the situation, build capacity adapting to the situation of the individual uh, indigenous community. And what Earth Observation can be used for is to help to monitor and to provide maps and also other tools to a better management of the territories of nature and, of, uh, and make conservation plans. So Earth Observations has, have a direct uh, role in these 
uh, in these activities. So I think that was um, uh, also something that we should bring home. Uh, another observation uh, that I think we need to, to think about, and that is that in fact, your voices, so the Geo Indigenous Alliance after this webinar to me seems to be even more important specifically because you don't have a seat in the UN, for instance, because you are not a nation or a government. And that is a specific challenge that you have. Therefore, my conclusion is that the GEO uh, Alliance, Indigenous Alliance is even more important. So thank you for those of you who have been in, involved in that. And we will continue the best we can to support that. Um, Another observation, I, and I saw Tanya, you were mentioning, and you know, the the water, food, energy nexus is something that we have addressed in Geo for many years. I've been involved in that, and and you pointed out also that green technology and, and green initiative not necessarily is a good for all um, inhabitants of the planet. And I think, th th you know, thinking about the consequences, you want to do well, but it might have a negative effect. And I think this is something that we should also bring with us. Uh, and that was, let me see if I had made some more note, notes. Yes, I, I just have to, to mention this, that language was mentioned, that you want to preserve your language. And in modern data, preparation, we talk about semantics, interoperability, you know, so the, that we are using the language, the same word means the same thing, or sometimes the different words means the same thing. That's an issue when you're doing data analysis. And I think that, you know, the indigenous, lang the indigenous languages is also fits right in that challenge that we have with that. And we should include your languages also in that process. And there, so there's a high tech uh, process or work science going on on that. And maybe, maybe I'm being optimistic, but having including your in, inherent knowledge about nature in your language, I think specifically of that, could be a very interesting challenge for a combined uh, scientific project, indigenous led and Western collaboration. So uh, with that, I, I conclude my short summary. I am so grateful for all of you speakers and for you, the attendees who have joined us this Friday evening in, uh, in Europe and in the middle of the day, most of the, the rest in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I, uh, with, there will be a recording. Uh, we will extract some of your statements um, we have been promised to, to further promote, to advocate, as James was saying, James was saying, um, the, uh, the role, importance of the indigenous people also in the group on our observation. So thank you, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much.